Hello and welcome to the City West Midlands blog and podcast. My name is Josh Brownlee and I'm the chair for the City West Midlands Region Committee. I'm joined today by Corbin Pennicott of Corp Limited. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> uh, Corbin is a self-made business owner with a background in electrical engineering who has built a successful foothold in the industry in the form of two companies, Corp Projects and Corp Limited. With a passion for engineering and entrepreneurship, Corbin started his journey from an apprenticeship and today is becoming a known name in the industry. Corp Projects is a national MEP project company that provides a range of services, including mechanical, electrical and public plumbing installations for commercial projects. Similarly, Corp Limited is a national facilities maintenance company that provides comprehensive planned and reactive maintenance solutions to clients across different industries. Corbyn's success in the industry is testament to his grit, determination and hard work. Despite facing numerous challenges along the way, he never lost sight of his goal and continued to push through with his vision. His expertise in the field of electrical engineering, coupled with his entrepreneurial skills, has helped him build a thriving business that is respected within the industry. In this interview with Corbyn, He'll share his insights into the world of M&E projects and facilities maintenance and the challenges and opportunities he's faced during his entrepreneurial journey. He will also shed light on the role of technology in the industry and his vision for the future. It's quite an introduction. I know, yeah. Flattered. Yeah. yeah flattered. Um, so, yeah, where, where did it all begin? I guess from, from, from the start. Uh, so pre-setting up um, the businesses and, and kind of my, my life in work. Um, it was, it started at Warsaw College, so I mean, I, I guess like a lot of people in the industry or, or outside the industry looking to see what they want to do, uh, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, I haven't come from a family of tradespeople. Um, my dad was a software developer, uh, my brother's a software developer, so if anything, I kind of came from way outside the, the kind of construction industry. Um, so writing programs for Windows and Apple and... Yeah, like Linux based stuff okay. and then different things. So yeah, um, so that, that was kind of um, dad's background. Uh, uh, granddad was the design engineer. So a, a lot of stuff um, from, from that side of the scope. Um, yeah, but not very much construction trade related items. Um, so it's kind of... Uh, and unaware, didn't know what I was going to do, um, and kind of coasted into the, the construction industry, if I'm honest. Um, I was looking for things to do. There was incentives to kind of study at college and go up to your level three um, in, in electrics uh, or plumbing, and I decided to go down the electrical route, um, which I really enjoyed. Um, we had some, some really good teachers, really good tutors uh, along the route, got really, really involved with it. Um, I managed to do uh, quite a bit with Warsaw College, which was really good. I uh, learned a lot and started my apprenticeship. Um, and I, I suppose from then, you know, gathered a bit of interest more so into the electrical fields and, uh, and just had that kind of want to learn more and, and delve a bit deeper into the industry. Um, and then when I was qualified, just going then on to kind of learn a bit more in the design aspects of the, the job, a bit more into the different sectors inside the industry because there's just so much to, to learn in, in kind of construction and, and building services. Uh, so yeah, uh, just kind of developed on there and then naturally kind of left the business that I was working in at the time and um, left or was slightly pushed by the wife um, to, to leave and set up on my own on the basis that I was going to work three days a week and, and, and drop some time. Um, so you've had jobs in supermarkets and restaurant chains and those sorts of things during a levels and no I, I pretty much went straight from um straight from school to uh, college and then straight into an apprenticeship okay so i did i didn't really do anything other than there i mean prior to that it was just the standard paper ends that, uh, yeah. that everybody kind of does um glass so collecting and yeah yeah anything you can to kind of make some money uh, on, on different items but uh yeah um pretty much yeah Okay. So yeah, always had that sort of uh, problem solving, quizzical, uh, interesting in um, engineering type mind. Yeah, I, I like to think so. I think, um, you know, growing up, always interested in how things work. Um, 
and I think that's one of the key things that are kind of overlooked a bit is um is people don't necessarily get the right uh interpretation of what being involved in in building services is um and I think it's, it's really key that those type of people who who are looking to know understand how something works fault find and, and get a real joy out of fixing something or knowing something or learning something and um, I think that's what really drew me to to the electrical side of the industry and what really furthered me in, in wanting to learn more was that that kind of thrill of fully understanding how this item works how I can fix it and then supporting others in, in, in fixing it as well and, and there's a lot of a lot of that sort of stuff so you learned to wire a plug and yeah <laughs> terminate yeah. a you know gland a joint and yeah yeah I think I think as well apart from the, the kind of the basic things that you learn in, in electrics there's a lot of really cool things that um the industry veers off into I mean from that base kind of qualification, that base understanding that you get when you leave college and you've done your apprenticeship, um, which is semi-influenced with whichever um, company you end up doing it with because you, you end up veering along the line of what they do as their day to day. Um, there's so many different other avenues like control engineering uh, on different things. I mean, that's, that's, that's a world on its own. Um, you know, and as you venture into different sectors of that industry, that's where I think it com becomes more interesting because you, you can then transfer the fundamentals that you've learned and, and fully understood up to that stage and really see how they work in the real world and, and kind of pull point on, on, a, on a larger scale. And just power or data as well and electronics and um, communications? Yeah, I mean, just the kind of standard power data, you know, lighting, all the, all the general kind of um, entry electrical installation items was what I've kind of studied and, and went through my apprenticeship on. Uh, we didn't really get involved too much on electronics apart from, you know, your, your basics on, on basic BMS systems or anything like that. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was that was pretty much my background as, as we went into it. And then more and more got involved into the commercial sector um, and do a bit more in the designs and, and different sections there, which was really interesting because I think a lot of the times as well on that entry level, you you, you kind of learn rules of thumb for everything. Everything's a, oh, we do it this way. And, and this is size because that's the size that works with X, Y, Z, protective device. And, and all those really, you know, basic things that you learn along the way. I think then when you start looking at design and, and understanding fully how you calculate and how you, um, how you size and, and allow for different types of protection methods, I think then it becomes more interesting because you you fully understand why some things are rule of thumb and, it, and it's an easy kind of option. Um, but yeah, th again, I think that speaks to the depth. Uh, you know, it, it's as deep as you want to delve. You know, you, you can always go a bit deeper. There's always more to learn. There's always uh, different sections inside the industry to learn more about. New wiring regulations. Yeah. yeah. Which was it when you, you were at college? I'll start, see, I'm, I'm, I'm young. <laughs> it was the seven, I think it was 17th when okay. I came out. I was wondering 16th, yeah. 17th, but uh, yeah, 18th yeah. currently. Yeah, 18th yeah. and then too, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, again, it's come along. Um, you have to keep on top of the revisions. You have to keep on, on top of everything. I mean, uh, CPD is a big thing now, um, pushed more and more. And I think it's a, it's a really good thing to, to keep on top of because you forget everything if, if you don't keep on... Um, continually developing and, and learning something. It's easy to forget half the things that you've done at college. And I think that's a step that a lot of people are in, you know, everybody's learned the fundamentals at one stage, but if you don't use them on a day to day, and if you don't continually um, remind yourself of the different options, then it's easy to forget them. Um, yeah. RCDs, RCBOs. Yeah, IFDDs now, you know, really, really big pushes on, on those items. A lot of change again in, in the impacts how we're designing our MEP projects moving forward and, and the kind of the design meetings that we do have with, with clients who are potentially unaware of the changes. And um, so with the changes to IFDDs um, and the implications to, to, to people in like the you know, care industry and different ways, a lot of kind of high risk residentials um, is a big thing at the moment. Um, and a lot of the projects that we were looking at this time last year have changed you know, dramatically over the last year and year and a half um, in, in what the scope defines and what, what's required to, to comply nowadays. So what's a typical project for you then? Scope-wise, um, I, I like to think we don't um, 
niche ourselves into anything particularly. Um, like we'll, we'll do anything from from a shed, um, which is you know great uh, warehouse. Yeah, yeah. Like warehouse. Yeah, big big warehouse um, kind of empty shells kind of stuff uh, to care you, home. with an office on the front as well. Yeah, know. yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, you know, large scale warehouses are always nice work. You know, it's a uh, it's good work to be involved in setting that up. And even the, the cat twos on, on those are really good. Just in Shropshire or West Midlands or across the country? So we, we deliver nationwide, okay. so, so from Scotland all the way down to, to London areas. The only areas we typically don't do much is, is kind of the, the South West leg, uh, although we've been uh, entertaining some projects in there for some of the clients. But yeah, I mean, even from, from warehouses uh, to care homes to um, student accommodation, uh, you know, even offices, new builds, test facilities, different things. I think that's that's what I enjoy as a person. I enjoy the diversity. Right. I think uh, so. I, I, I really try and push that to the team. So from pre-construction, when we're, when we're looking at different tenders, what we want to tender for, I think the only thing that we don't really get involved with um, is domestic uh, houses, so new build houses. Okay. Um, but yeah, apart from that, it's. Uh, Anything of interest is, is on the table. Really. But that student accommodation bit is their home, isn't it, ultimately? So, um, but at the yeah. same time, it's not an owner owner occupier, is it? Yeah. I think the yeah the, the key difference for us on on the kind of the houses as opposed to student accommodation is it, it's it's almost a different type of of construction and approach to the construction, um, and it it would semi be a different division inside the business because we'd have to run it so so differently to how we run on the commercial um, pieces. Um, and I think we, you see that a lot in the, the types of builders that do do houses uh, are often not the types of builders who, who do large scale commercial um, ventures. Yeah. Um, although, yeah, every now and then you do get sucked into doing a plot of houses next to a development because it ticks a box. But yeah, um, just in general, I suppose, uh, we don't really really touch that side of it. Okay, and uh, typically you'll um, get some general arrangement drawings, I'm guessing, showing, you know, a, a, a kitchen here and a living room there and an um, office area here, and then look to design the, the lighting systems and the data systems and CCTV and... Yeah, so, so I mean, because we do full MEP, um, there's, there's quite a bit to taking the designs from that stage through to stage five. Um, again, there's a lot of variance in, in what we've seen and in tendering recently, you know, whether it's a, a design and build or, or just taking it from stage four to stage five in the design process. But yeah, I mean, typically we'll, we'll end up getting some really, you know, basic drawings uh, and developing it from whatever the specification requires. Um, I'm working along with, with really kind of key supply chain, key consultants. Um, and I think that's, um, that's where we found a bit of success is, is really developing those relationships and working alongside the consultants rather than um, you know uh, going toe to toe against any sort of changes and that. Um, yeah, but I, I suppose yeah, typically we'll, we'll we'll take it from stage three to stage five um, on the design piece. So typical days, what in here in the office or um, out on site or? Um, I'm pretty much here in the office most days. A lot of the as with anything now. Um, a lot of the meetings that previously we would have been driving to London for and driving to, to you know Aberdeen for a, a nice and easy to, to jump on teams for. Um, although uh, you know milestone events on projects and, and reviews and different items are always great to kind of go out and, and see um, with the team. Um, but yeah, uh, pre predominantly I'm, I'm, I'm in the office um, overseeing a lot of the items and, and having a lot of internal meetings with, with our pre-construction and construction teams and then on the maintenance side with our contract managers. Okay, and a busy day yesterday, I hear. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we, we had a, a long drive yesterday. Uh, we were going out to look at a speculative project that we were looking at for a, a large uh, hotel, new build in uh, in Brighton, um, which we're hopeful to kind of secure. But um, yeah, uh, and then from there to Maidstone, and then Maidstone back to here. So yeah, I mean, the, the days are diverse, really. You know, it's, it's not just in an office. Um, you know, head in hands or anything like that. But uh, it is a case of we, we do generally end up because it is a national um, venture that we undertake uh, for, for the clients. 
and um, you end up doing some some job and sometimes going out and seeing things. Like that. So that was potential clients or existing clients on a potential job. Yeah, 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 existing clients on a potential job. So yeah, um, we did a bit of legwork in the background. And it's, it's a sizable, um, sizable job, sizable venture. You know, again, um, really uh, interesting uh, design. I mean, that's only stage four to stage five. Um, but yeah, so the design is pretty much pretty much there. We just got to take it out uh, across the line. But yeah, again, you know, a, a nice higher spec hotel. Um, so yeah. And you get out on site when during the installation phases as yeah. well, checking yeah. quality and resources and materials and labour and. Yeah, I mean, pre predominantly the the contract managers and project managers really try and ironclad on a day to day basis that the the, the quality is there that we're on schedule, you know. Ticking all the boxes from a, from a commercial and, and quality perspective, um, but yeah, definitely, uh, I think it, it's one of the key things just to know what we're doing, how we're doing, what it looks like. Uh, a bit different from receiving an email saying we're on track to, to actually going out and, and seeing the bill while it's in progress. Yeah, and all of the financial side of things as well, and invoicing well, and financials are a massive part of it. I think um, financials. Uh, are so important in the construction industry as it is and um, i do obviously quite a lot in the financials on, on the business especially on projects because it's very um contract driven um keeping awareness in the team of uh correctly enacting uh notices as part of the jcts and nec contracts is a really really key thing that i think often gets overlooked um because everybody's wanted to get the job done, you know, want to get the job done. But yeah, it's, it's a really, really key thing, um, monitoring the finances and, and the commercial on the project, yeah. Yeah, and you know, being uh, an engineering type mind is not necessarily a legal type mind, is not necessarily a commercial type yeah. mind, but they all need to be taken into consideration for success. Yeah, I, I think that's a really, really key point. And, and like I mentioned earlier, and, and delving deeper into the industry, you touch everything. Um, and one of the areas where I'm continually learning, and I've had to really learn quite quickly, um, is is the legals, is the the finances. And, you know, I, when I went into um, starting the business, I, I, I had no clue how to raise an invoice or you know what CIS tax was or anything to payment do with terms. terms. Yeah, payment terms. You know, JCT to me was you know. I thought it was JCB, you know, I, I, I knew nothing about it. So I think that the lessons you learn across, you know, the the, the experiences that you uh, kind of get involved with across learning and, and seeing these different projects and the values increasing and, and then also the, the contracts getting much tighter. Um, it's, it's really, really key to, to kind of develop and learn with that. And I think with regards to um, our business, my CPD is, is more so being on the side of learning the finances, has been learning legals, has been really understanding, you know, collateral warranties, what it is we're doing, uh, and trying to reinforce that to the team. Um, so yeah, I mean, and I'm, I'm by no means the, the full article on any of it. I think the, the key deliverable for me in, in, a, in allowing us to, to, to deliver these items is having the right people around you. Yeah. I think a really key thing is not being the smartest person in the room all the time. I think we're just kind of bouncing off your peers and, and having the right people around you and having the right resources to be able to get legal advice if you need legal advice, to be able to get financial advice if you need financial advice, and even um, technical support if you need technical support. And that's where, you know, the, the, the strong key relationships come, in, come into play on that. Yeah, it just goes to show that every day is a school day and continually learning and it's lifelong learning rather than just that formal schools, colleges, universities part, you know, yeah. you continue to learn and, and gain the experience in multiple fields when you leave those establishments. Yeah, well, 100%. I think I've learned so much more in actually being involved in the building services industry uh, on the go and uh, ad hoc, um, but I think there's a lot more resource now to be able to, to protect yourself. And, and, and I suppose if I was telling myself, you know, 10 years ago, um, what, it, well, or if I was advising somebody who's looking to start up their own um, business now doing it, and I think I wouldn't, I'd advise them away from the, the route I went to. Um, I think it was a bit naive, some of the things, but, but I mean, I suppose, 
you have to work on the principle that if you, if you, if you make a mistake, you learn fast from it and, and just make sure that you, you don't make it again. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think there's so much to it. There's, but there's really a lot of resources in, in learning the, the legals, the, the tax implications of different things, financial implications, not just knowing how to do your job well. There isn't enough in, anymore in the industry to, to ensure you do get actually paid for, for what you do. Yeah. Anyone in particular you might like to know for uh, help and support and mentoring and uh, along the way? There's been so, so many great people, to be fair. Um, I think um, the, the ECA has been really, really good. I mean, Rob Driscoll's a great, um, great mentor from, from kind of a legal perspective. He, he's, he's really good, wealth of experience, wealth of knowledge. Um, from like a peer's perspective, there's some really fantastic experienced people out there. You know, there's people like Des O'Neill, uh, Interclass, you know, uh, another building um, contractor, you know, really phenomenal experience in the industry. And I think that's the key thing. You, you never know everything. And it's being able to ask a question or, or even, you know, talk to your peers and talk to people, professionals that, who've, who've really made it in that industry and learn from them rather than trying to figure it out on your own yeah and as you say um you know it's one thing making a mistake it's another thing learning from it and trying not to make that same yeah. issue occur again in the future well, well the easiest thing is, is is to not make the mistake at all if you took the advice in the first place um but yeah definitely if, if you make a mistake you know learn from it that that's the key thing so sustainability wise um how do you get involved with that so a, a lot of the projects are uh, very sustainability conscious. I mean, uh, I suppose there's a lot of facets to it. Um, there's a lot of parts where it touches our business, um, from even net zero projects to even you know what our CO2 contributions are going to be as a business and, and how we're going to try and mitigate issues that, that I don't think we have a solution for yet. And I think that's that's why it's a, it's a constant um, question to us, I guess. Um, from a projects delivery perspective, it is part of every job. Um, doing solar PV, um, air source heat pumps, ground source heat pumps, all these kind of different renewable options to, to improve um, projects moving forward. You know, it's just a key deliverable as part of the industry. Um, from an actual operating our business perspective, um, we're, we're working hard to try and minimize or minimise the, the amount of reliance on diesel vehicles and moving into kind of electric vehicles where possible. I think there's there's a bit of work to kind of be done for working mileage on the vans because again, uh, as we've got engineers from Scotland down to lot mates and why, um, a lot of the engineers do a decent amount of travel, decent amount of mileage um, in reactive cores and plant maintenance. So um, really getting vehicles that we can we can make sure. Uh, meet the, the requirements so that we can still offer the services that, that we need to. Um, and so that's a, a client bringing you up on the maintenance side saying I've lost power or I've lost my lift or yeah. you know, I've got a bit of an issue here or a break has tripped. 100%. So, I mean, maintenance, you get a, a whole ream of, of different um, call outs and types and everything. And because we, we offer that kind of hard services on maintenance um, throughout the country, yeah, anything from, you know, there's, there's a gas leak, there's, you know, uh, yeah, break is stripped. I've got no power to the kitchen. I've got X, Y, this is affecting my trade. All those kind of three hour response times, four hour response times, you need to get an engineer there. I think there's, that, that's a great um, thing that I, I really enjoyed when, when I was doing it um, and when I was on the tools and every day is different. There's, there's a lot of fault finding. There's a lot of interest in kind of doing new things, you know, touching different parts of the job. Um, and I think the bonuses as well in, in that kind of uh, MEP kind of industry, working along with other colleagues who, who are very much biased on something else, you know, they're, they're very uh, mechanically biased and then those joint tendencies to try and close out issues for clients. It's a fantastic way to learn. And I think a lot of the staff that we employ, we, we, we try and do um, like growth programs for them. So after people have passed that, uh, that kind of probation period, it's really trying to analyse what do they want to do, and, and often it, it might it might be surprising, and um, when we do review it, because uh, the HR team might kind of peg that this electrician might want to move into fire alarms, but often the people really want to just 
have a go at something diverse, you know, um, but people, the amount of people who want to kind of bridge across that, I mean, uh, um, it, it's, it's interesting. I think it's really a really good thing to push because they, they do connect really heavily. Um, and I think often there's a bit of a, a gray area in between where, you know, a gas engineer won't touch X part of the controls, but an electrician won't touch that part of the control. And, and there is that little gray void where we're trying to bolster our team to go, well, let's, let's upskill them. Let's, let's get it to the point where, you know, if this gas engineer wants to learn more about electrical systems and what, what are the um, training opportunities that we can provide to, to really upskill this guy. And likewise with electrical engineers who might want to move into the air conditioning industry. And I think it's really interesting. I think it keeps people bought in, especially at a stage where I think, um, it's a bit of a candidate's market at the moment. You know, people can move around and and move from a job here to to a job at another company and for an extra twenty p an hour or fifty p an hour. And there's always a bit of a, a scenario where there's always somebody paying more. So I think we're trying to look for different ways to kind of go. How do we keep this team bought in? You know, and, and I think how we keep them bought in is is investing in them. And if somebody wants to invest their time. In working for us consistently, we we want to invest our time working in with them. Um, so you've got people across the country uh, able to respond to an, an issue, whatever the issue is, yeah. with any of your clients within three to four hours yeah. nationwide. Yeah. So so that's a, one of the key key service level agreements with with a lot of the clients. So we do a lot in um, in hospitality. Yeah. So on the maintenance side. Um, we we do we've got contracts with Marston's, which are the butlers, um, Weatherspoons, you know. So that's the pubs and restaurants, yeah. as well as beer production and so, certain logistics. So, so more more predominantly, it's involved in the pubs and restaurants side of things, um, rather than kind of the beer pumps or anything like that. Um, but yeah, again, it creates a bit of a diverse um, array of items that could be flagged up as a call out or something to look at. And again, you know attending a job within three hours is, is part of the contract it's it's getting the right person there getting them to be able to diagnose and, and fix or or temporary fix something in a position where we can then come away from it leave it leave it safe and operating and i think they're they're things that as a team um we do well um you know triaging those calls um but yeah it's it, it, again i mean for it being a similar well for it being under the envelope of MEP, um it's so so different from the environment of projects yeah yeah you mentioned um bms systems building management systems control systems and it's always seemed rather uh, strange to me that that falls under the mechanical side rather than under yeah. the electrical side mm -hmm. but uh, it, it's sort of a, a classic example of where that collaboration piece between mechanically biased and electrically biased you know yeah. plumbers and electricians where we need to work together yeah because without the power supply to the pump on either the air conditioning unit or uh, a fan then those ventilation systems those water systems don't yeah. operate um so yeah it it uh, a client may report that they've got no water or they've got no heating systems, yeah. but it's not actually a mechanical problem. It needs an electrician or it needs a controls engineer to go out and fault find and respond and react to it. Yeah, no, you're right, 100%. I always found it interesting that the BMS falls under the mechanical side of the packages. Um, but uh, that's where we found, um, well, quite quickly, that it helps to kind of be that MEP thoroughbred when you're offering that as a package because it doesn't, uh, coordinate very well otherwise because there, there is always that question of you know is this an electrician's job is this a you know one of the mechanical engineers jobs um, and I think even to, to more on a basic level taking it away from the large kind of commercial BMS systems even at heating systems often there's there's a, a, a massive amount of question marks over yeah I've installed this valve uh, this two port valve on this system or a three port valve on a on a wide plant and the heating engineers, oh, we need an electrician to connect this because I don't know, you know, what goes where. And electrician will come in, oh, I'm not a heating engineer. And, and that's where the, that, that gap is. And that's where I think there are, the, there's courses out there and people do get trained in heating controls, but there is always that air of unknown, that gray area of, you know, is this this person's job or is it that person's job? Yeah. And I think, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot of interesting things to do in the industry. Yeah. 
you have direct members of staff or subcontract the, the works to key supply chain partners? So we, we, have, we have a mix. Um, and I think that's that's really required. I don't think anybody can directly deliver everything, um, although you know, some, some, some might want to. And I think that where direct engineers and direct staff give you the, the, the control that you want, um, it also adds an element of um, requirements for when a, a project's finished and then moving on to the next project. And I think we, we have a really good supply chain. We have a really strong um, supply chain for, for multiple different um, resources, whether it be electrical, solar, um, whether it be air conditioning, um, you know, mechanical ventilation, ductwork. You know, there's some really good people who, who really heavily specialise in, in those industries and do a fantastic job. And I think a lot of the times on projects, it's a case of we're there to make sure it's nice and coordinated. We're there to make sure that the, it's delivered no issues, that we actually deliver what um, is written on, on that kind of contract. Um, and on maintenance, it's, it's a degree of, there's a lot of specialists out there, there's a lot of specialist controls. There's a lot of specialist items where it, it needs that interaction from somebody who, who might just do that item. Um, so yeah, we, we rely on both. I think maintenance more heavily relies on direct engineers to fulfill a lot of the requirements, whereas projects is, is built on the shoulders of, of some really strong specialist subcontractors. Yeah, and having that maintenance um, aspect to the business as well makes it even more important to get the installation correct. Uh, rather than having to revisit and then muddy the waters between whether it's an install problem or a maintenance problem. Yeah, I mean, one of the real key things that I'm trying, and if I'm trying to sell our business to, to a, a client, is that, you know, we intend to be there to fulfil these collateral warranties that we're signing for 10 years down the line. We intend to to maintain the equipment after it's been installed. It's not a case of that we're there to install and we'll never, ever see them again. Um, we, we've got a vested interest in making sure that installation, whatever it's been designed and built for, performs because we, we ultimately want the return business of being able to maintain that ourselves. Um, so, yeah, it's really, really key to deliverable for us. And um, what keeps you up at night? <laughs> um, I suppose, I suppose the, 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 the biggest thing in, in the construction industry is the volatility in it. It's, it's knowing the right clients, it's working with the right people, it's it's the legals, it's making sure notices are issued on time, it's making sure um, you're working with the right clients. And again, like I said before, it's, there's a lot of um, lessons that I've learned along the way and, and really being selective with who we're working with. You know, not every contractor is, um, it, not every contract rather is, is a good contract, not every client is out there to just make sure that um, the, the job gets done and everybody gets paid and every, everything finishes there. I think that was part, part of my naivety when I approached the, the industry uh, self-employed, um, was that, you know, this belief that if you do a good job, you get paid. I think that the, the Construction Act doesn't necessarily um, protect subcontractors um, in that route. And, and I've got no knowledge of how it, how it, how it interacts with them principal contractors back to clients because that's not really our industry. Um, but yeah, there's, there's definitely a lot of volatility there. Um, so I suppose, same as, as majority of business owners, also, I think the, the things that keep you up at night are, are always going to be, well, what if these people don't pay, you know, payment issues? What if this client, you know, X, Y, Z? I think that's, that's easily seen from the fact that there's been so many similar companies going under recently. I mean, we're lucky enough to be you know, have a really strong foundation, be working with some really good clients where we, we, we don't face those issues anymore. Um, but yeah, not everybody's so lucky, um, which is why I think there's so much liquidation in the industry. So in simplistic terms, just for our viewers, that those that aren't aware, um, you guys will agree to um, design and install certain systems, radiators, lighting systems, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then you'll be appointed to do that installation. So you'll have to go out and buy the radiators to get all the light fittings, to get them supplied to site so that yeah. the electricians can then install them. But you won't necessarily get paid for those until 30, 45, 60 days after the month end yeah. that you invoice. So it could be 90 days, a quarter, three months or so away from when you actually spend the money on yeah. the 
plants and materials. I think that's a really, it's, it's a really interesting thing that not a lot of people or people external to the construction industry don't believe or they don't realise. Um, yeah, it's very, very, very rare for anybody to ever get any sort of money up front. Um, if they do, they're kind of heavily, heavily specialised or specified even. Um, yeah, the majority of situations are you going entering into some JCT contract where you will provide services and you'll apply for them uh, as an interim application at the end of each month um, and then be paid on whatever the payment terms are for that contract after it's been certified. Um, so I think the, the big uh, question mark comes there is, is it's that certifying process and it's, it, it's where the money sits and um, although everybody's got the right to adjudication um, and suspension of services which are not, which, which form part of the contract, these are things that, that you're allowed to do if you give certain notices at the right time, but often by the time uh, a notice has been issued or, or there's a disagreement or a dispute's been raised or crystallised. Uh, contractors are so in bed with the money that they've invested into it that they've got no choice but to continue and to, and to finish. Well, presumably you'll have needed to pay the yeah. wages of the electricians and the plumbers and the duct fitters and yeah. all those sorts of guys in the meantime without getting paid yourself necessarily for it. 100% um, because you'd be seen as uh, not fulfilling your contract if you were to just stop and not continue because you couldn't pay your subcontractors or your engineers or your staff. Um, yeah, it, it, it's an interesting one. It, it's a difficult one, but I think that's why a lot of businesses um, fail. It, it's just based on the fact that there's not that fast support there for subcontractors. I think something that we really try and pride ourselves on is that you know, when we're analysing which projects that we're taking and, and obviously vetting the clients and when working with people who we, we know and we trust, um, is that regardless of what our situation is with a contract or with, with any sort of build-up, we ensure that our staff are paid, that our specialists are paid, that our subcontractors are paid because, you know, that's how we'd love to be treated. But yeah, I understand that not a lot of contractors can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, what's your guilty pleasure? Guilty pleasure. Um, I don't know about guilty pleasure. I suppose. Uh, I suppose. I, you know. I, I enjoy playing guitar. Um, I, I'm, I'm boring, really. I'm uh, acoustic, electric, electric guitar. Electric. Yeah, electric guitar. So yeah, I enjoy playing guitar. You know, like anyone, enjoy enjoy a, you know drinking pub with, with with friends. Other than that, I'm I'm pretty much a boring guy. <laughs> favorite riff. Favorite band. Favorite band. Uh, yeah, I'm a, I mean, I'm a bit, I, I really like Alterbridge, he's, he's a, you know, good, good, good rock band, but yeah, um, yeah, I mean, big fan of Rammstein, but, uh, you know, German uh, metal band, but yeah. Uh, so just coming back on to education and training and um, uh, institutions, I know you mentioned, I think you mentioned NICEIC, any other institutions or professional bodies or? Yeah, yeah I mean. The nature of the industry is that you, you need to work with these bodies, you know, you need to be approved by these bodies. So yeah, all, all the all the staple kind of institutions, you, you gas out, F gas, NIC, um, ECA, the, 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 they're all supportive in whatever industry that they're the kind of support in. I, th I think the ECA have been fantastic. Um, one not to be overlooked with the support levels, they're, they're, very, they're very good. Um, but yeah, yeah. Um, what about mental health? Mental health, I think, as with everybody, as with every business, as with every person, it's become a, a massive thing in the workplace. Um, it's become something where you you can't ignore it. It's it's it affects every part of it. And I think with the construction industry being what has been a, a very old school mentality um, in the industry, it, it's coming around now, and there's a lot more focus on it, um, it from from even from clients down throughout the supply chain and um, it's something that we have to be really aware of in especially in high stress environments um, the maintenance team work really hard um, constantly dealing with call outs and people who are stressed over the phone and and some people it, you know it, it really takes a, a, a it's mentally draining for them and uh, well, they've got a problem and that's sort of 
being communicated to you and yeah. maybe slightly misplaced, but at the same time, you've yeah. got a, a role to play in hopefully resolving that problem. Yeah, and th and that's just kind of from a work aspect, you know, and, and we've got to be there, you've got to be available to to, to be and, and aware enough to, to notice these things because not everybody's going to come to you and say, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with XYZ. It's about having the right line managers and, and aware people in place to be able to notice that actually, you know, X person is not not been the same recently what's going on and it could be something at home but even still people spend a lot of time at work yeah. um and you know spend, often spend more time with work colleagues than they do with with friends at home so yeah. i think it's a really really key responsibility for us to 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 be aware of um and not all things can be fixed overnight you know and not all things can be fixed in, in the short term but i think it's been awareness and knowing and moving together with uh, in, in collaboration with those people, it's a, it's a key part of the job. Okay. And last one for me, uh, where can people discover more about you? Uh, I'd say I'd say follow our LinkedIn. Uh, he's probably the most updated one. Saying that though, I don't think we've updated much on LinkedIn recently. Maybe maybe by the time this airs, we will have a couple of posts more out. But I'd say gen generally, we, we, we post more on LinkedIn than anything else because it's more um, tied into the industry, more tied into to kind of the, the clientele that we target. Um, we don't do any blogs or anything like that um, as of yet. I don't know. But yeah, predominantly LinkedIn. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for joining us and sharing with us what you have today. Uh, if anybody watching or uh, listening would like to uh, share their thoughts with us, please don't hesitate to do so. And if you'd like to feature on a future episode, uh, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Uh, please like, comment and share. And we look forward to the next issue of the City West Midlands Region blog and podcast. Corbin, thank you very much. Thanks for having me.